So I was hoping, Josh, maybe you can just give us the two-minute um, plot summary of the book, and then I'm going to ask you a couple quick questions, and then I would love for you to read a little bit before we actually get into a longer discussion. Okay, it's like three steps. What's right? the book about? It's actually yeah. like by by a factor of maybe thirty, it's your smallest book that you've ever written. Right. Um, so it, this shouldn't be too hard. Right. <laughs> if I do it right, you'll option it for like a like a series or something, yes, right? That's yeah. Right. So you want the pitch? Uh, it's about uh, uh, a guy named David King, who um, owns a moving and storage company. It's sort of active, uh, really in the five boroughs, but throughout the tri-state area. Uh, and he has a, uh, a cousin, a uh, sort of distant cousin from Israel who gets out of the IDF after uh, serving, in, uh, serving his compulsory stint uh, and, uh, and seeing combat in the last Gaza war. And after he gets out of the army, this cousin, Yoav, uh, comes to work for, uh, for David uh, in his moving business and uh, brings along a, later a friend of his, Uri, who is his squad mate, and, uh, and they begin sort of uh, having a gap year uh, where their jobs are to be essentially movers. Uh, then soon it, they're moved into uh, the realm of eviction moving, uh, uh, sort of in the wake of, uh, of the, the housing crisis here, uh, you know, dispossessing people from their homes, seizing possessions, and they find some odd rhyme between their activities here and, uh, and their activities back uh, in Israel or the Palestinian territories. Um, so, the book is not a joyful book, although it's quite funny. Um, and it, it's a book that is about Jews, um, and it's about American Jews and Israeli Jews, um, but it's not a book in which they're portrayed in what anyone's grandmother at a JCC would describe as a nice way. Right. Um, can you, I think that's in some senses was, well actually I, I'm interested to hear you talk a little bit about the point of writing, not necessarily even about this specific book, but the point of writing characters and specifically Jewish characters who are um, n not palatable. Right. Uh, can I just say I'm a realist and then move on? But no. Uh, no. So, right. So, uh, I, I actually tend to think that this is not, you know, uh, like, unlike every other problem in the world, this is not a Jewish problem. This is an American problem. What is an American problem? Um, the loss of specificity and parochial audience that you have when you're writing uh, uh, in, an, in an adopted language, in a culturally adopted language. You know, if you were... Um, writing in Yiddish for uh, Yiddish speakers in Europe. You were writing, you are writing in, in Hebrew for, for Hebrew writer, for Hebrew readers in, in Israel. You know, you are speaking to quote unquote your own community. Um, there is this way in which these communities, you know, these ethnic or racial communities persist in the United States, but the writers aren't writing uh, just for them. I mean, if I told Random House, I'm just writing a book for Jews, you know, I don't know that they'd be so happy. So the idea is you have to, uh, you know, when you write about these kind of subcultural experiences of any sort of immigrant or uh, uh, any immigrant story, any story of assimilation, you end up actually having to broaden um, your canvas in a certain way, and you, um, and you also begin um, having to uh, kind of almost pander and lose detail. And so I am saying that by pushing against your idea that it doesn't portray Jews, this book you know, doesn't portray Jews in a JCC light, I would say the JCC light is a profoundly anti-Jewish position. Um, if you look at Yiddish literature, you certainly look at Hebrew literature, it's full of you know, Jews doing bad things and Jews doing good things, Jews doing everything. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so the idea that this would seem in some way um, bad for the Jews is essentially just a, a statement about how America um, expects these, uh, you know, these American success, success stories and these sort of positive depictions of, uh, of, of acculturation. Right, but um, I guess I would say that f 
that there's, for a realist, there's a lot of the Jews doing bad things in the book, and right. not a lot of the Jews doing, not, not even a, like a quarter or a fifth of Jews doing good things, which I guess I, it's, speci it's very specific is what I, what I mean to say. And right. I wonder whether or not, frankly, I actually think that as a result, it makes mm -hmm. the book much more general. Like I think it is much more compelling in, for a broader group of humans, mm -hmm. um, but I wanna know the process by whether or not that's how it felt and whether or not in some senses that's the point of it. Uh, to a degree, it is the point of it, uh, uh, and how it felt. I, uh, the time in which I was writing the book, felt like, um, and maybe you know, it's 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 the prerogative of you know the delusional prerogative of the writer to think that events in their own life sort of match up with the with the world. But uh, in the time in which I was writing it, um, there seemed to be a stripping away. Um, both in my life and in the world of these um, of these elements of uh, almost consolation in fiction right uh, uh, these false depictions um, we, we were you have this sort of uh, uh, desire to almost have a non fiction novel you right. know these auto fiction right. novels that have sort of shown up uh, uh, that purport to you know be real life right and, uh, and I was very, very interested in what I saw as real life, but not among, honestly, that socioeconomic class that typically writes the right. autofiction novels. Right. I, I wanted to write a novel about work. I wanted to write a novel about um, people not, not making moral decisions, but doing what they have to do within the systems that they were born into, right? And I wanted to write a novel that had a lot of that sort of um, essentiality and 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 hardness that I began to feel honestly in the world. I mean, following the the housing crisis. I mean, I hate these words, financial crisis, housing crisis. We need to find a better Hebrew is much better at coming yeah. up with these like <laughs> abstract nouns that you know mean crises. You know, but uh, right, it literally could be like uh, there was no red pepper at the store, or right. the entire housing industry just collapsed right. in and of itself. Right, right. exactly. Right. So so <laughs> so you know, watching these scenes of people. Um, uh, being dispossessed. Right. Um, first watching it on New York One, which did wonderful coverage, uh, and then going up there, um, sort of with the dregs of the Occupy movement, um, and, and uh, I say dregs in a positive way, meaning they stuck around, they didn't just go home, uh, uh, to create these human chains, these human barricades around these houses, you know, up in, in Wakefield in the Bronx, um, and sort of daring the marshals to come through these barricades to dispossess these people and, and, and put all their possessions out on the curb and then having to sort of guard your possessions on the curb from neighbors who would scavenge these possessions that were just out there. I just, I, it, it triggered this, it triggered this, this sense memory of, of, of seeing these scenes um, in Israel. And, uh, and seeing these scenes in the Palestinian territories, right, in the West Bank. And, um, and so th there became a desire, um, because anyone who's moved in this city knows that so many movers are Israelis, there just came a desire to not set these things up as a metaphor, but to show how these people, these two Israeli soldiers, sort of just participated or experienced both. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I actually don't see it as uh, to go to your large question, as a negative thing, I don't see it as a um, as 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 bad for the Jews. Nor do I see it as, frankly, um, shameful. I see it as um, I see it as as truth. And as long as truth is is sort of um, you know attention is paid to that, I, I don't think that there's any um, harm that can come from it. I mean, certainly, you know, is like Babel being a Cossack. Right isn't responsible for the Cossacks killing the Jews. Look, for the record, I don't think there's anything bad about it either. Um, I was just trying to warn the people who bought books to come to the event Sorry. Yes. that they weren't actually getting maybe what they've become used to. Um, so um, it's very hard to talk about your work without actually hearing it um, because the 
the language is so much a part of whatever discussion we have. So if we could just take a quick second, um, have you read a section for us, and then we'll dive into some deeper questions. Okay. Deeper than questions about Jews. Okay. Uh, this is um, just the, I'm gonna read a little part of the opening. Uh, David King is the, the owner and operator of, um, of King's Moving, moving and storage business. Um, and he's trying to drum up some business uh, from a uh, wealthy developer who uh, obviously has kind of bought up some homes that are in foreclosure and trying to knock them down so that new condos can be built. Um, and so he's trying to kind of drum up some business as the guy who uh, you know, evicts those tenants. And he, uh, uh, he does this out at the Hamptons on uh, July 4th. I thought this was a seasonally appropriate section. It was summer. Toward the weekend of a holiday week, moving day, followed by Independence Day, and David King was out in the Hamptons at a birthday party for America, to which he'd been invited as a member of the Empire Club, which had required attendees to donate upwards of $4,000 for the privilege of drinking diluted booze and eating oversauced barbecue under the auspices of the New York State Republican Committee inviting him to a party, and then making him pay. That was class. That was how billionaires stayed billionaires. And David, who'd resented even the toll to the Long Island Expressway, couldn't help but wonder whether he'd met $4,000 worth of people yet. He couldn't help valuating everything, the people, the property, the Victorianized manse shadowing the pool. His phone was vibrating again in his pocket. He canceled the call. He was working. He was working by attending a party at which he didn't know anyone or knew only that he recognized names, faces, profiles. It was work having to restrain himself from mentioning mergers he'd only read about, acquisitions that weren't his, a celebrity stranger's divorce custody negotiation still ongoing, having to endure discussions of clean ocean and beach replenishment initiatives when all he wanted to know was daughter or wife. When all he wanted to know was, does anyone know where our host is? It was work, pretending he blended, he mixed, pretending he wasn't sweating and had a second residence of his own and was a Hamptons vet and agreeing, yes, yes, hadn't the Meadow Lane heliport gotten so crowded lately? And yes, yes, isn't Ray from Elite Landscapers just the best? Because the fact remained that David had never been this far out on the island before. And not only couldn't he tell you which of the Hamptons he was in, he couldn't even tell you the number of Hamptons, or the differences between the Hamptons, or what made a Hampton a Hampton singular to begin with. Hope we're not keeping you, a lady said. David said, come again? You keep checking your phone. I've got foreign business, he said, never stops. It's already July 5th, somewhere. And he excused himself from that besant of lawn and its assembly of skinny flagpole women flying dresses in red, white, and blue. Ruth, his office manager, had been calling without leaving messages. Now she was gibberish texting. Sorry, sorry, Bill's sick. I have to take Bill Jr. to baseball practice. And then, anyway, I'm not finding the pass card. David made his way among tents, buffet tables of chafing and carving and bars. The trick was to keep on the move. Kids. Put David around kids and he'd fantasize about having them. And only then would he recall that he had a daughter who was an adult now. The kids were having their faces smeared native with war paint. They bounced around on a giant inflatable galleon, parried and thrust with balloon swords. A breeze blew in with the dung of elephant rides. He moved among servers who made $8.75 an hour, and so who made about 14 cents, 14.5833 cents, he did the figures in his head, for each minute it took them to carve him prime rib, or fix him a scotch, or direct him and his menthols to a smoking area. Conversations collected as they were conducted in circles about stocks, about real estate, stocks, about renovations, and how draining it was to open a house for the season, Apparently, to have two houses meant always neglecting one of them, at least. About alarm systems, sprinkler systems, sump pumps, white versus black mold, about politics. 
David's politics were aspirational, inferior. He was in favor of contacts, contracts, the right to not diet, and the right to jump lines at dessert stations. David King was a man who, if a longtime employee flaked on a commitment on short notice because her ex-husband was too ill to take their son to a baseball practice that wasn't even hardball but actually softball, or if his prime rib came closer to medium than to the already spineless concession that was medium rare, or if his doers 18 turned out to be doers 15 or 12, or God forbid came with an ice cube or even just an extra splash of water, or if the line for the dessert station was moving so indecisively slowly that his ice cream would melt before he got to the toppings he liked, it wasn't his fault that he was so decisive about his toppings. He'd scream, he'd have a conniption, and yet once he'd fudged his sundae with a cherry atop, he had all the attention, all the guilty, sated, childlike attention for being lectured by an Ivy League B student on the new model Gulf Streams, though David didn't have his own plane. The best sailing routes, though David didn't have his own boat. The best steeplechase courses, David didn't even have a pony. How New York State was the most regulated state in the union, the state with the highest taxes, state with the highest energy costs, the highest fuel costs, the highest insurance premiums, and a convoluted body of tort law that made even the Nazi justice system seem unbiased and lenient. And how so-and-so was really the only candidate to bet on, so-and-so the only candidate who had real plans, both for the Middle East and for mid-sized American businesses, the only candidate who was legitimately pro-growth. And that was the line or the jargon that struck him and brought to mind the image of a small, modest, neat building, like some four-floor pre-war walk-up in the village, which, with every vote for a Republican, grew taller by the floor until it became this big, shiny clock tower that clock-handed all of Manhattan. And then, by association, his mind flashed below his belt, which was on its last notch, and below his gut, which hung like a panting tongue over it to his bloodless dick, which, as if his heart had betrayed the party platform, pro-growth, dangled limp and useless. Um, okay, so I think it's important um, I think it's important to explain um, the book's politics or the book's non-politics or the book's every politics or however you describe it, um, only because I think that, or, or, and, and I think that when you explain it, um, what I'd like you to touch on, I think that a lot of readers come to fiction for a lot of the reasons why we've already touched on with anxiety about what the book is supposed to mean and what they, whether or not it's a book that is going to be valuable um, and, imp and is going to be a good book for the causes that they think they have in their lives. Um, and the answer, especially a book that has anywhere, anywhere, literally on the back flap, the front flap, any of the pages inside the word Israel. Um, so in order to alleviate the anxiety of anybody in this audience who may not know whether or not the book is going to be good for them or not, um, First of all, the answer is no, right, um, right. but it will be really, really interesting, but probably not good for you if that's what you're looking for. But could you just explain to them why? Right. <laughs> I mean, uh, I'll try to answer it in this way. I, I, don't know, I don't know how this happened. Uh, I, have, I have a few ideas, and, and part of the ideas, you know, is a longer answer about, you know, my generation's sort of reaction to to boomerism, let's that's say. That's what I want. Right, that's what you want. So, so I don't know when we woke up and everything was, was politics and everything was political. Um, and you know, the idea that, that, and even saying this is not political itself being a political statement and all of these rabbinical, you know, Jesuitical lines that, that everyone learns when they study you know, one semester of theory in college uh, or they read Zizek you know, on like two edibles. So, you know, uh, politics are tiny, politics are small. Politics um, are, uh, uh, are ways in which to speak publicly and speak uh, across many different, you know, 
quote unquote special interests about these deep and abiding powers in our lives um, that, that, that control us before we even become cognizant of a state. So uh, this book is really about family and about the, uh, uh, I don't wanna say even the politics of a family, but about the power relationships in a family. Um, that, that, that politics is, is just the weak reflection of, or what we call politics is the weak reflection of. Um, and I, I really think that, um, and I'm not saying this again to avoid the idea that there's, that there's a political statement in this. I'm saying that I believe it is, it is, it is, it is desperately important to, um, if Israel is a family issue for you, um, to speak as if it is a family issue and to not think that you know, you're gonna make a Shanda by the Goyim or that you're going to in some way um, embarrass the Jews, right? You need to speak um, uh, directly to these family ideas. And, and this book is about David King who has kind of failed with his family here. And he treats Israel very much in the way of, of, of that generation that came up, you know, it, it really before the 67 war, before the beginning of the occupation, whose anniversary is this year, the 50th anniversary. Um, it, you know, it, it, it's an exotic place in which to both get in touch with you know, more authentic identity, but also a place where, you know, one can begin again from the essentials, right? And, uh, and, and so his relationship to Israel is very much that. His daughter's relationship to Israel is very much like, you know, it's an apartheid state. And, and the politics of the book, or the book contains both of those politics. And what it is essentially about is reducing these politics, or sorry, amplifying these politics to the level of family. I mean, I was thinking about this today, right? Because, you know, th this is, uh, David King is obviously, uh, you know, it, it's an inversion of, of King David, right? And uh, King David, who you know, began life as the sort of, you know, the sweet psalmist, the harpist, who became this general and had so much blood on his hands that he was not allowed to build the temple, right? He was, he, 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 he was a killer. And uh, one thing that's very interesting about kings, about not just the books of kings, you know, from the Bible, but just kings in general, and you, can, you don't have to look in the Jewish tradition for this, look at the house of Atreus, you know. It's um, kings rule nations, but they're always destroyed by their families. It's always the son that kills the father. It's always, you know, it's always the brother who, who, who kills the brother. And it, it, it you know, the, the, these kingships, these kingdoms are, you know, they're governments uh, of men and not of laws. And so, you know, when I woke up the other day and you see Donald Trump Jr.'s email <laughs> and everyone is, you know, saying, you know, what is this, what is this? And I'm, I'm saying to myself, like, spend a little bit more time with the Greeks spend a little bit more time with, you know, with the Book of Kings, and you understand that, you know, this is how, um, this is how these reins are brought down. I was just saying to myself that instead of reading Twitter, we should all read the Book of Kings again, um, which might not be the worst idea. Um, right. Um, related to your concept of family uh, and broadening it out a little bit, there's a, there's one line that's my favorite line that I just wanted to read only because I want to ask you about it. Um, so Yoav and Uri are the two um, Israelis um, who served in the army together. Um, and at some point, they, toward the end of the book, they finally start to say everything that they feel to each other. Right, Uri, Uri um, uh, saved uh, Yoav's life, or Yoav believes that Uri saved, saved his life. Um, during uh, you know the the two weeks of combat that they saw in the Gaza in the Gaza war, right? Um, at some point, Yoav is explaining to him a lot of what he feels, and he's sort of, in some senses, he's just uh, disintegrating, but he's he's being very clear. But he then says, "And I wouldn't have realized any of this without leaving the army and the rest of it. But then you show up, or you're pressed, and, or you're pressed on to me, and I can't resist thinking." where he says, he says, what? He says, I can't help thinking, what, you coward? That you're what I'm trying to forget. Okay. And I thought to myself, I feel like that's the story of the Jews. That there's always a Jew that they're trying to forget. Mm -hmm. um, and in many ways now, I feel like that's 
if I had to say what I thought the politics of the book are, it's actually pulling at that idea that in fact, whatever, from whatever angle you practically come at Jewishness, the desire to forget other Jews and to pull away from them is actually the thing that's going to right. make it come apart. Absolutely, absolutely, and 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 you know there there is this idea that um, uh, I mean I think we should. It, it takes many pages for me to get to that line. Not that right? many for you. Well, right, 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 right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's true. It's true. I'll accept it. But but you know it it's 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 it. How about this? It, it took me a lot of work to get to that line because a lot of work. Yeah, work. And and and. When I say that, I, I, it, it's this entire process that is at once, you know, um, I think very Jewish, but again, also very familial and also very cultural. And uh, when, when I say cultural, I mean, mean? I mean coming from a, a, a any homogenous, you know, or, or, or like delusionally homogenous right. state. Okay. You know, I mean, th these are um, these are people who are coming from. Uh, a pretty ethnically diverse country, and yet they're all Jews, right? You know, uh, uh, Uri comes from a, a Mizrahi family, Moroccans, right? right? Um, uh, Arabic is the native language of his grandparents. Um, Yoav uh, is sort of like a, you know, sort of like a Michelin, he's, he's a mix of, he's an Ashkenaz and Mizrahi, and, 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 you know, they have squad mates who are Russians, the squad mates who are Ethiopian, right? But, but there's still this one national identity. And, and what I wanted to show was they, 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 in a sense, are constantly being reparented. They have these families in which they receive the identity in their families, and they're both the, um, the only sons of their families, right? Mm -hmm. And then from there, they're reparented by the army at, at a very young age, the age of 18, right? Um, and then they, 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 they come into the army in which you know, they're reparented by officers, right. and they're told what to do and they finally get out of there at 21. And they get out at 21, and that's the first time that not only can they make some decisions for themselves, but it's also the first time they can leave this country. I mean, Israel, remember, is, is it a country you just, you can't drive out of, you know? Uh, uh, and there's not many places, you know, you're really gonna go in about the southern half of it that you care about, you know? And so, so in, a, in a sense, like, this is their chance, right? And it, it's the idea of, on one hand, having this chance for freedom, but then there's always this reminder. You're always kind of being dragged back. Um, and, and this presence of this one other Israeli who shares his experience, in a sense, um, annuls his possibility uh, of freedom. So I, I think that there's that, there's, there's, there's this argument there. Then there's, you know, I think you're right. There, there is, there is that the, the Jewish argument as well, which is constantly trying to strip away um, a definition, you know, and constantly trying to, you know, not be reminded of who you are. Right, but it's also like, um, it's also, I don't want to be part of a Jewish community that's right wing, or I don't want to be part of a Jewish community that's anti-Zionist, or, right, or I don't want to be a member of a club that would have me as a member. <laughs> right. right. No. no. Sure. But sure. Sure. I mean, I, I, absolutely. No, actually, I think it's. I think it's different. I think it's, I only want to be part of a club where everyone is exactly like me. I right. think Jews have changed. Yeah. And I think now it is, there is a sense of, I need everybody mm -hmm. in the Jewish community to look like me, religiously, politically, socioeconomically. Right. And in fact, the thing that, it, it's not a community, at least in America, it's mm -hmm. not a community where the thing that binds all of these people who come from potentially diverse right other demographic right. markers is the fact that they're Jewish. Actually, they all kind of look the same. Right. Yeah. And so then, in some funny way, how does that, I guess what I'm asking is, is, is David King representative mm. of American Jews? In some way to me, he's not. He's special. Yeah. I mean, I, I, think, I think to a degree, I think to a degree he is. I mean, uh, let, me, let me say, there's, there's two things that, that I think are, um, that are important to say. One is, you know, I, I, I just, you know, I want to share my politics with everyone who shares my identity, right? And this desire to sort of have, um, 
to, to have a, a, a unified front, but also a, 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 a unified sort of inner life within, within, within a subculture. Um, you know, this is a thing that, that always perplexes me. This is the 50th anniversary of, of, of the occupation, mm -hmm. right? People um, sort of don't remember that the occupation, this is not what they teach in Israel, and this is certainly not what the left here uh, uh, understands either. So both sides are sort of ignorant about the occupation began in 67 from the left. It was kibbutzim. It was a, it was, it was a socialist, right. like the, the first quote-unquote settlements on conquered territory was by the left. Right. And so now when you say settlements, you think of guys, you know, you know wearing hats and payas and, you know, uh, and, it's, and it's this right-wing thing and, and it's this, you know, religious thing. And in fact, it began as socialism. And so I wanted to write a book that would say, you know, let's throw away these labels and even throw away these appear appearances. Let's talk just about the experience, you know, the, the facts on the ground, right? And let these definitions, these political definitions float through it. That said, I do think that there is this, um, that there is a, a different um, uh, uh, identity or political identity that David King has. And that identity, I think, very much comes from, uh, you know, what, what I think you call, as much as I call, street Jews. Right, and and that really is a uh, it, it is a, a a it is a type in my mind, and I define that type uh, almost exclusively um, through uh, through trauma, almost a genetic inheritance of trauma. You know, they, they are the children of people who came to this country having survived the war or as refugees, people who did what they had to do to survive, and there is something in that. Um, almost desperate amorality of the survivor generation that gets communicated um, uh, to that next generation that believes, in fact, they must fight for their existence even when they are not um, imperiled. And David King, to my mind, is, um, is the paragon of that. He's a man who can't have a relationship. He can only have a fight. He can never have a disagreement it, it only, it's only a question of, 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 of who's going to die. He fights to the death. Um, and, and because he's incapable of, of, of having a perspective of a disagreement. The, there's another line where, he, where David actually, toward the end of the book, says, um, an imperiled Jew should just jet to Ben-Gurion and beg asylum, but that option wasn't his. He was a Jew who couldn't seek refuge in Israel, who needed another Israel, who needed an alternate. Right. And I almost thought that that was, uh, to me, that was where he became the hero, because that's, right. that's, that's just the truth. The truth is, right. is that you're always going to need an alternate, because your life is just going to always present you with another problem. And the thing that you came up with five years ago to be your solution is not gonna be the solution anymore. Right, and I think I, I, I absolutely, that, that was absolutely one, um, you picked two of my favorite lines, but I like that, we, and we didn't even talk before this. <laughs> but, uh, uh, but that, that. I mean, we that, never even, we've right, never even met. Never met. But, but no, that idea that he needed, that idea that he needed another Israel. Okay, so I've, you know, that, that's, a, that's my version of that, you know, of, of, of an old Yiddish joke of, you know, do you have another globe? You know, <laughs> right. but 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 um, that also for me was just the slightest nod toward um, in his life toward the spiritual, and I think you know, th and that's something that I kind of want to just uh, I want to insert here because in in the Jewish tradition, mm -hmm. right, and you know, in the Yiddish tradition especially, but but um, but really throughout, uh, there were two sides, and they weren't left and right, right but it was the natural and the supernatural. Right. Right? It was, you know, what is here on earth? And then occasionally there would be this breaking of the membrane and there would be a demon, a dibbik. You know, there would be some ghost or inhabitation that, that, um, that, that, that in a sense cr creates craziness. And, uh, and, you know, in the most basic psychoanalytic reading, of course these things, these, these, these demons, are ways of explaining inexplicable behavior. That's, it's not because they're ways of explaining, it's because they're real. Because they're real, right. Okay, we can go no, with No, I, th sure. I think that there's an inch, I think that, 
I think that there's a way in which that's an assertion of a new kind of um, categorizing for Jews. Right. Are you not right wing or left wing, but uh, do you believe in the supernatural or not? Right. And, and, and that is so embedded in the literature. Right. And, and, and it's so embedded also in the way in which, um, in, the es in the eschatological impulse, which yeah. is to say, you know, it's not about where you go when you die, it's about all of these worlds um, existing at the, at the same, same time. time concurrently and one sort of bleeding over into the other. And so I, I decided, you know, uh, this person wasn't going to, I mean, y we can get back to the first thing that you were asking about, which is like, you know, this sentimental, boring Jewish literature where everyone is nice, you know? And the truth is, is that to bring someone back or to give someone a revelation in that world, that person would have to kind of come back to the community. That person would have to make amends. That, ha that person would have to apologize or in some way make reparations for what he right. did. And, and instead, I wanted to give the slightest glimmer of, um, of another world, you know, of, of, of this idea that, you know, um, he was maybe um, inhabited. And not in a bad magical realist way that like, get it, he's an asshole because he had a ghost in him, right? right? <laughs> but, but, but in a real way of saying sometimes these behaviors right. and our ability and, appetites, and our passions right. and our appetites like really can't be explained by anything other than, um, than these immemorial forces f coming into our lives and, and diverting their course. The big question, of course, is, is whether Israel is that or exile is. Um, the, I guess, give, saying all of that, I, I do want to circle back a little bit. Um, I know it's, I know it seems a little annoying, but I do want to talk about writing the book into this space of this particular political landscape. Mm -hmm. I think we're at a time now where, on the one hand, there is so, um, it's hard to say that, um, that everyone wants to shave the rough edges off of ev everything when Donald Trump is your president. Right. It's just, it's clearly just like a, a, like a man of walking weird rough edges. Um, but actually, in a funny way, I don't see him that way. I see him as actually smoothed out to some weird spectral figure. Um, I do feel that the, in politics, there's enormous ugliness on the one hand, but it's a reaction to shaving off anything that's, that has friction, mm -hmm. um, anything that's controversial, anything that shouldn't be said. Right. And there's a way in which this book is very, um, without having politics that I think anyone would recognize mm -hmm. as peggable, um, right. the book is very aggressive um, w in a way that, that I quite enjoy. It's literally the opposite of the sort of warm Twitter hugs that people look for right. um, or like warm social media embraces that we look for now as a regular part of our lives. This book is actually not that. Um, I, I, I had this, I had this um, moment where um, I, it was all, it was the, the fake news post fact world. Yeah. And, um, and it, the, the question that was being asked, you know, is do you really think that, you know, pick your percentage, because who knows what to believe, you know, d does X percent of America really believe that, you know, Hillary Clinton murders people? You know, uh, do, you know do X percent of people like, you know, really believe, you know, whatever, whatever. And, uh, and there was a moment toward the beginning of writing this book, uh, or to, to the, like of, of rewriting it and kind of putting it into final form, where I just had this, um, this idea that, that, um, that all of the American public in this way were just actually really good readers of literary fiction. And that they were just misapplying the techniques of reading literary fiction to the political sphere because they were suspending their disbelief. <laughs> um, I think that, that they, they were, they know that, that, that this is bullshit, that, that these Trump things are lies, but they also know that if they suspend their disbelief, and I think they learn this more from television and movies than from books, but you suspend your disbelief in the hopes of a larger payoff in the end. You know, in, in the sense that there's a denouement, like there's a catharsis, everyone will be brought home. 
And it also, it's a way to give narrative shape to deeply episodic lives, right? Is to sort of constantly suspend your disbelief because you believe that the person who's asking you to suspend your disbelief has a large plan, right? Has a large narrative arc. And so they indulge all of the figments, all of the fantasies, all of the imaginations, all of the lies, because not only is it entertaining, but it, it feels in some way cumulative or building to a point. And I realized that, that Donald Trump was being accorded all of the privileges of a novelist, with the exception of, you know, poverty and being edited. <laughs> um, and, uh, and whereas I was living and writing novels at a time where I had all of the burdens of the presidency, but none of the perks. I had to be uh, responsible, polite, honest, politically correct, uh, like, you Have know. Have a Twitter feed. Right, yeah, and a good citizen <laughs> and a Twitter feed. Right. And, 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 and to, to, you know, to, to live in an age in which, you know, the, those things are, 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 are flipped around is, um, I mean, it's ludicrous, and, uh, slightly demoralizing, but on the other hand, it, it, it actually shows how timid uh, writers have been that, that we can settle for this good citizenship award that we, we're gonna settle for the censoriousness of, 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 of the communities that we're in, and we're not actually going to assert our abilities to be um, obnoxious, aggressive, brash, because at least we're doing it toward an end. And the end to which I'm trying to do it is to show the processes by which the very people whom Trump, I think, tries to appeal to, um, realize how they've been lied to and manipulated and try desperately to find um, other meaning. So you're saying that if we all buy and read your books, um, we eventually, the balance of the universe will tip back well, that would be and the then Trump we'll get a say, normal sure. presidency I mean, again. there's nothing more Trumpian than inviting all of your friends here and then asking them to pay 20 bucks. I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean, I should be giving like degrees or something and giving <laughs> branded water, but, 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 but seriously, uh, uh, the, the, um, it is very interesting to me how, not just writing, but writing in particular, has really seeded, um, has really seeded that ground um, has really seeded that, that, um, that aggressiveness and that ambition and that, um, and that sort of thumb in the eye mentality. Because in a sense, um, it's, it's, that's where it always should be because it's always in literature rhetorical. Right. It's always in literature, you know, in experiment in feeling right. and not an experiment in policy. Um, we're gonna uh, throw the conversation out to the audience, but before we do, I want to just state for the record that uh, you were ever thus. Um, this was this is not a new posture um, that you've decided to take based on Donald Trump. Um, in fact, uh, Josh is the first writer I ever hired, um, and it's true. I've told this story before, but I'll I'll tell it again because I don't think I told it to that many people in the audience. Um, I, when, the day that I became the culture editor of the Forward, I got on the subway and there was a copy of the New York Press on the seat. And the cover story was about Jews and porn. And I thought, oh, that's funny. And then I started to read it. I'm like the newly minted culture editor of the Forward. And by the time I got to my stop, I was in tears. And it was actually one of the most devastating things that I've I had remembered, could ever remember reading, and um, it's not online, so if any of you want to read it, you have to email me, and I'll send you the PDF. Um, but um, I contacted Josh in, in part because all of the impulses that run through um, even this book, um, which is different from his other books, they're all there, and there's something essential and true about them, and it's really, um, it's pure, and it's exciting. and. I, I love this book. So congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so now we're going to throw it out to you guys. Does anybody have any questions? This. Who has a question? Come on. Porn, Israel, do your thing. Ask anything. I can keep asking questions? Great. Um, can I ask you to read something else? 
Can I pick it? Sure. Great. Yeah, you can pick it. Yeah. Can I show it to you what I want you to read? It's the other one of my favorite parts. Right there. Is it here? Yeah. You can read through just this part. Or you can also read the whole thing. Actually, read the whole thing. Okay. You like this one? I did. Okay. All right. This is uh, Don't psychoanalyze. Just read the part I asked you to read. You like that I know the names of furniture. <laughs> like, it's like, that's impre like that to you is it's impressive. Like, like, I, it's like I know five towns girl porn. Yeah, totally, I, totally. I thought he knew the name of furniture. <laughs> right, right. This is, a, this is a Lawrence dresser, not a Hewlett dresser. Um, so, yeah, this is, they're, they're moving. They're, 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 they're actually moving people's uh, possessions. If the customer was present, odds were they'd turn out to be customers, a couple, which meant friction. What you did was you instructed one member of the couple to stay at the old unit and the other member to wait at the new. This tamped down dissension. Still, typically what you'd get would be one member of the couple at the old unit able to be calm and without opinion only because there'd always be that other member at the new unit yelling at you about vase placement, about what the hell were you doing taking up that crevice with that deflowered vase. And what shocked Yoav was that every couple he jobbed for had evinced this divide, straight or gay, irrespective of gender, there was always a leader, a commander, as implacable as an, as an apartment's dimensions or a circuit breaker impeding at mid-wall. The low leather suspended from tubular metal futons had to go across from each other and perpendicular to the recliner. The workbench-like table had to be set with a chair at each extremity and disposited flush with the counter, parter walling the kitchen. And the shaker dresser that Yoav noted was missing two drawer handles prior to transport was to be situated, regardless of all physical limitations, in the bedroom athwart the bed. The customer having calculated, or having sworn that he had calculated, the minimum clearance by which an open drawer wouldn't bump an open door. If you couldn't angle a table, you had to amputate its limbs and hump the rest across the banisters. If you couldn't get a dresser through the door just by taping its drawers, you had to remove the drawers and then, in turning, let the hollows accommodate the knob. If the argument was with you, give in. If the argument was within the couple, stay out of it. Customers fought as you labored on their own time. And the nastier fight, the nicer the tip. Um, the reason why I liked it is because it pretty much word for word happened to me. <laughs> um, so you did well. I, I did because I felt bad because we had a huge fight in front of the movers. Um, but the but there was something right about it, and I think that that's in some senses what I think that's in some senses what's not what's really um, interesting and layered about this book is that there's a lot about relationships between couples. There's a lot about relationships between parents and children. And there's a lot about relationships between countries or gl a global people and their relationship to each other. Um, and it all exists simultaneously. Like, I think actually that, that, that this section works about a lot of things, not just about moving. Yeah, there's something about moving that seems like a deeply, um, uh, you know, Jewish... Uh, activity, not just, you know, because of some bad wandering, you know, metaphor, but it's, you know, every move is sort of like the site of an emergency. It's the site of a failure, you know, the essential failure being the failure to stay put, you know, people sort of run up there in a panic and have to, you know, move things that are breakable while people are screaming at them, you know, uh, and then they have to sort of reassemble it elsewhere um, in some semblance of, 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 of normalcy and they have to do it sort of, you know, within a window. They're showing up to places where, um, you know, couples are breaking up and, you know, a couple, one moving to one apartment, another's moving to another apartment. They're showing up to places where, you know, parents have died and children are kind of squabbling over an inheritance. You know, they, they, they are these sort of sites of panic and sites of, of failure in many occasions that, that, um, that always, uh, 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 you know, generate um, these these or, 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 or canalize these emotions that are deeply embedded within the relationship that lived in the place. 
for I so mean, long. I don't even think you have to be that negative about it, right? It's just a matter of, uh, it's about, it's their moving is about change. Yeah. And it, that's... Yeah, I'm sure on your moving day, you were that calm. <laughs> I'm sure it's like, how's it going, Alana? And you're like, oh, moving's it's, about change. Exactly. It's fine. It's fine, um, but I paid them for two hours. Right. And if they're a minute over, right. <laughs> okay. We have a question over here. Uh, yeah, Josh, I have two questions for you. One, uh, to what extent do you feel like this is actually a departure for you? That seems to be the critical reception. Are you moving into a new space? Is that, is that, is that, was that conscious, or do you, you feel like it's pure continuity? Secondarily, when you started writing the book, um, did you know what was going to happen at the end when you started writing, or did you discover that in the process? Thanks, man. Uh, yeah, I don't know. They just, you know, they just say it's like a new thing because it's short. And, you know, I mean, I'm not going to complain about, you know, I'm not going to complain about positive reviews. But I, I will slightly, <laughs> which is to say that, you know, when you, um, when you lament in the first paragraphs of a review that you couldn't read or didn't read the longer books, you wonder what book critics are getting paid for. They're not you know, getting paid very much, yeah, they're, Josh. They're getting, they're getting paid. Uh, and and uh, those guys are getting paid. Uh, and <laughs> you know, uh, honestly, it's 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 uh, uh, four new messages were short. Other things were short. Um, you know, two books that nobody pays attention to because they're on small presses were short and are pretty good. I don't know. Um, I think that uh, uh, I think that that there is a tendency. Um, you know, writing about the internet. Is, is, is in a sense comparatively easy because, uh, you know, because we don't have that much of a tradition of literature about the internet. Um, writing about Israel is really, um, and, or writing about you know, Jewish sort of Zionism, you know, the Jewishness of Israel, you know, you're looking at um, a lot of tradition and you're looking at a lot of things that, uh, that uh, especially on the large novel, the capacious, you know, the, 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 the loose baggy monster side of, of the equation is, um, is on one hand, uh, uh, you know, sort of canonical and boring, like, uh, you know, Herman Wilk or, or, or Leon Urs, you know? And on the other hand, you're looking at um, very, very, um, you know, foundational texts. You know, remember that, you know, Hebrew being a language that, that hasn't, uh, uh, you know, that was just revived in the last century, you know, the, the, the books that are really about the founding of Israel are books that are really about the, the founding of, of, of the language. And that seemed very daunting to go long on that. Um, it felt like that was, uh, it was something that I, I, I was not equal to. And, uh, and in terms of uh, the end, yeah, I, I had the idea of doing something that was very, um, you know, that was, that was very schematic in, in, in a way. Um, and the reason why I wanted to do that is I, I, I felt like, um, you know, the, the sort of plot where you sort of obfuscate from a reader, um, uh, uh, you know, what's going to ultimately happen seemed to me sort of disingenuous. Um, I, I, I wanted to, uh, be, be because the, really the change in the book or the thing that happens in the book is not, aren't events, but I think the, the, the way people feel and their own paths in life. Um, I, I knew that the end was going to be this, this eviction um, that was going to be of a, uh, uh, of a Vietnam vet, of a black convert to Islam um, who uh, had his mother's house and sort of lost his, his mother's house. Um, and I knew that it was going to be this um, sort of revenge mess. Um, and, uh, and I was afraid of writing it you know, of that, of, of that conflagration of the fire at the end. Um, well, because first of all, it's difficult to write fire, you know, only a certain number of words for fire. And then, uh, but it was also because it seemed to me very, um, it seemed to me very expected. And so a lot of it was just like building the, the, the sort of courage to, to, to do the expected thing, to walk directly at what I knew was coming all along. And, uh, uh, and that, that was terrifying, actually. Is that a departure, knowing the end? Uh, 
Or no, in every in writing every book, you sort of had a sense of. I mean, I outline, so toward the middle, I kind of know. Usually no, but what's, in the same happening. sort of emotional sense of. The emotional sense. Very much having a pull, knowing exactly which direction you're going in. Well, look, I, I, I wanted to do something that 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 I've never that I've never done before. Okay. And I actually consider it to be the one of the most difficult things to do, and uh, maybe some people here care about going this granular with fiction, maybe. See a couple of people. So yes, we all right, care. We all, want to go we all care. So you know, one of the weirdest things, um, and uh, one of the strangest things, that is a creation of the second half of last century, is a book where the characters are only introduced um, at the point at which they further the plot. Right. You know, um, the classic nineteenth century, you know, um, you know, realist novel, you know, is uh, uh, you, you unfold your three or four strands of plot which uh, have your three or four strands of characters, and you combine them into some sort of ending. You know, toward the idea of, you know, what has been called the systems novel, and, you know, we can have all these ideas of nomenclature and they get boring, but there, there's this idea of a character really only gets introduced when they take, almost it's a relay race, they take the baton of the plot from the previous character, and they advance it and they hand the baton over to the next, or the microphone over to the next. And uh, I was fascinated by, uh, by those books, I think very few of them are done well because right. it's very difficult to do. And, uh, and I, I knew that I wanted to do it because that feels to me it's like a, um, it feels to me like a, a thrilling way, not just to write, but to read. Yeah. Because if you sort of know that's the kind of book you're getting, you, you understand that every introduction of, a, of another character, or another narrational focus is actually going to unsettle the action uh, tremendously. Right. You can also keep your eye on the baton, yeah. whatever that is. It's interesting. Yeah. The question for Josh. Really? Um, <laughs> uh, both David and Yoav and Uri um, spend a significant portion of their lives kicking uh, poor, disenfranchised people out of their homes. In David's case, he's uh, literally kicking them out of their homes and taking their property. In Yoav and Uri's case, they're part of a systemic occupation. Um, but Yoav and Uri, the Israelis, seem to at least have some understanding of what they're doing and some understanding that what they're doing is wrong. But it never even occurs to David, the American, that there's a sort of irony in being a Jew, uh, an exile, mm -hmm. and yet doing the same to poor black people. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious what the distinction you think is between the American Jew and the Israeli Jew. I, I don't think that there's a distinction. Uh, uh, I don't think there's an essentialist distinction. I just, I think that uh, when you, um, it's, you know, I know this from my own life, from, you know, when Alana hired me, it's the first person she hired, she, I think you found me, I was in Romania or Poland Moldova. or something, you know, Thank you, and I, you know, spending, I spent, you know, a number of years outside of this country. I think you, you really only recognize um, what your country does in the damage that's, that, 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 it's, that, that it does, this, the kind of the systemic damage, you say, um, when you're outside of it. And I think that, um, that you can be in an army and you can wear a uniform and you can be, you know, mutually responsible for the lives of your of your squad mates and not really recognize that what you're doing um, is, um, is systemically wrong, right? Um, typically, you know, if people have those conversion narratives from the perspective of being in an army, they, it, it, it comes down to these very individual or intimate events that, that, that can happen in, you know, home raids or in battle or something like that. But, um, but they come to the States and they feel, uh, they can see it in a different light. And they see it in a different light because uh, uh, first of all, because it is a different situation, right? Um, but they find themselves doing some of the same actions, um, taking some of the same, you know, strategies and tactics um, as they did back there. And, 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 and because it is in a different context, because um, right down the street from these homes are delis that sell them, you know, beer and cigarettes, because right down the block are very fancy bars that David's daughter works at and bartends and sells, you know, um, you know, $14 cocktails, um, 
you know, next to the bodega that has, you know, the food stamps, um, I think that they, 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 they can finally recognize um, the human pain of dispossession. Um, from David's perspective, I think that, um, you know, for him, uh, he is looking at that same displacement, but he's looking at it generationally. You know, from David's perspective, he inherited his father's business. His father was a Holocaust survivor, and he bought a truck, and he's essentially, you know, no one wanted this job of, 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 of hauling out these homes, you know? Um, no one was going to kind of, you know, I wanted to be a mover, I couldn't break into the moving racket. Uh, uh, this was the dirty work I did for this country. And because my family did that dirty work for this country, you know, my daughter can live in a brownstone in Crown Heights having gone to NYU and learn um, all the ways in which I can be um, convicted. But I think for him, um, he doesn't recognize it because he is uh, still very much trapped in the idea of um, I, am, uh, uh, I am the front line. Uh, if I had been some other, if I had been more privileged, I would be the people who own the building. You know, I would be the people who, uh, you know, own the development company. You know, I would be mayor. Great. I don't read a lot of fiction. I, I did in the past read Elmore Leonard, and I, actually your book reminded me of a, a, mm -hmm. a kind of Jewish street version of an Elmore Leonard mm. novel, and your use of dialogue, which was great, which is, I, I found somewhat new, and your repertoire is very refreshing. But, what I wanted to know, because I saw there were initials in the beginning of the book, which appear to be your, your father, your, your uncle, and your aunt. And I wanted to know what is it within that family dynamic that, uh, if it was, you know, that caused you to dedicate this book in their names for? My father, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> We're going to go there? Let's do it. No, it's, you know, um, one of I the mean, things... I mean, I like the rough edges, but... Yeah, well, that, that's, but that's what it comes from. Okay. So, you know, <laughs> one, one thing that I always, you know, one thing that I always found fascinating, on, you know, honestly, is the, um, and you can correct me on the, the, the exact facts of the story, but, you know, you come from that labor, you come from labor Zionism, right? And, and you had that relationship. Certainly your father did, right? And, and those were certainly the politics in which um, you were raised. And by dint of uh, uh, that disappearing, by dint of you know, where we lived, you could share the same religious or ideological dedication to Israel, but it comes from a different place. You know, where, where I went to school wasn't labor Zionist, right? And, um, and one of the things that I found sort of fascinating is to look at how even within this generation, and the older I get, it seems like we're closer in age. <laughs> but, you know, in just the space of the generation, what's amazing to me is how things that could be believed out of political conviction, or maybe even out of political necessity, can be believed um, the same beliefs can be had out of religious conviction or religious necessity. And the same beliefs can be justified, you know, through various iterations through the generations, but it's still essentially the same belief. And, uh, and that, uh, that was an interesting um, experience to have. And I know that of our many disagreements, not so many, uh, maybe we can add one with the Elmore Leonard thing, but, uh, you know, that, that was, uh, you know, politically, that is, that is an interesting disagreement that we have, an animating one. We can also all come back once a week um, for, like, some sort of family um, well, if it's real If it's real therapy, it's four um, days a week. Right. And, yeah. That's right. Okay. I really think we all need to be in analysis together. But, um, but for now, um, I wanted to 
just thank Josh uh, for giving us a real bunch of his time and uh, some insight into the book. And thank you all for coming so much. Thank you. <laughs>